baby on the deals, so, Nick. All right. All right. So today we're going to talk about uh, one of my favorite topics. And I'm going to get super excited. I'm going to start talking very fast. Tell me to slow down, okay? Transactions and concurrent control. I spent six years of my life worrying about this in grad school. Right? I f love it. Uh, before we get to that, though, uh, the things that are coming up in your schedule is homework four is coming out today, and then that'll, that'll be due uh, on November 12th. And then project three should also go out today. Uh, the what you end up be implementing will be discussed a little bit today, but mostly on Wednesday. Uh, so don't feel like an urgent need that we didn't put it out last week that you're, you're, gonna, you're gonna fall behind, right? Um, and I shouldn't say this, but the, it should be easier than project two, okay? But still plan accordingly, right? There won't be a, there won't be a checkpoint this time. Just, it'd be a final deadline, okay? And then also you saw my post last night about extra credit. A lot of you already signed up for your favorite system. Uh, some of the you selected ones that I didn't realize we already had articles for because uh, we had some people in industry I gave accounts to and then they filled out the articles. I, so I didn't, they weren't on the list of the unavailable systems. I went back and corrected you. Um, for, for the last time I checked this morning, everyone looked like they picked something that was available. Okay? All right, so where we're at in the semester now in terms of understanding the architecture of a database system is that we've gone up this entire stack. Right? We started off talking about how to do a better uh, disk manager to organize our files and, and data on disk. And then we talked about how to do a buffer pool manager, how to retrieve those, those, those records or pages from disk, bring them to memory, pin them, and modify them, write them back out as needed. Then above that, we had our access methods about how we can read and write the data that are stored inside our, our pages in our buffer pool manager. And then we said how we can uh, implement the operators in our query plan to actually do uh, further computation on these things. And then above that, last class, we talked about how to do, uh, or two classes ago, we talked about how to do query optimization and query planning. So now where we're at in the semester is that we're going to discuss these two additional topics, concurrent control and recovery. And I'm drawing then the boxes on the side, uh, but this is actually a bit, bit of a misnomer because the idea of concurrent control and logging and recovery and checkpoints, they're actually going to permeate all throughout the entire system. But we just wanted to go through this stack first and not worry ourselves about these things because they're sort of complex topics. But then now we're going to go back and discuss how do we actually incorporate these concepts into our, into our database system. And again, the idea here is that at pretty much every single level in the system, you need to be aware of what concurrent control scheme you're using or what kind of recovery scheme you're using because you don't want the system to make, to, uh, to do certain things with being unaware about how, uh, how these different these, these components are actually uh, operating. Right? We don't want to write data out the disk uh, in our pages before we write the log record that, that represents that change. Because right? otherwise you could crash and lose data. So today's class we're focusing on, actually this class and probably the next I think two weeks or so in the schedule, we're focused on current control and then we'll have a week discussing uh, recovery protocols. Okay? All right, so the, the motivation for what we're gonna talk about today can sort of be summed up, or actually going forward, these two high level concepts, concurrent control and recovery, can be sort of uh, best um, by these, these, these two different scenarios. So say that we have an application and we're gonna have multiple clients connect to our database system and we're gonna have two clients access the, or modify the same record on our database at exactly the same time. So what, we have a race condition here Right? And so we want to know what the correct behavior should be. Then we have another scenario, say that we want to take $100 out of my bank account and put it in your bank account, but then there's a power failure while we're doing this operation, or doing, doing this transaction. Right? Take $100 out of my account and put it in your account. If you take the $100 out of my account and then we lose power, what should happen when we come back? What should we see? So the first example is what's called a loss update, and this is what we're going to use concurrent control to protect. And then the bottom one is a durability issue, and this is what we're going to use the recovery mechanism of the database system to prevent. So concurrent control and recovery are sort of the two, one of the two most important concepts or features that a database management system will provide you, right? Because it's going to allow multiple uh, clients to, to, to operate on the same database at the same time and make sure that any changes you make to that database are persistent and saved after any possible type of failure, right? And when you think about it, this is, a, this is, is an excellent example of why if you're building an application, 
you don't want to fucking write your own database from scratch. You don't want to do it yourself, right? Because doing this is hard, right? And so think of it this way. Say you're a startup and you're, and you're trying to you know, get your product out the door and have people use it. You don't want your engineers spending the time worrying about how to do concurrent control or uh, recover any crash in, 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 you know, in your data after, recover any data after crash uh, for your application because these aren't differentiating factors for your application. Right? These are things you need to have. Other companies have these things and you don't want to waste your time implementing these things because you're probably going to do it incorrectly anyway. So this is why you always want to use a database minimum system. Right? Whether it's an embedded application, you want to use SQLite, or a really large scale you know, distributed application, and you want to use you know, a distributed database system, which we'll talk about later in the semester, you don't want to be doing this, because as we'll see as we go along, it's really hard to do these things. And so the core concept that we're going to rely on and leverage all throughout the, the, the next couple weeks is this idea of a transaction. Right? And we want our database management system to execute transactions and provide what are called ACID guarantees. So quick show of hands, who has ever heard of the acronym ACID? All right, mm, a little less than 50%, but that's fine, okay. So again, I'll explain this, this lecture today will be about ACID, but we need to understand what a transaction actually is first, and then we can understand how we, we achieve ACID with them. So a transaction, as described in the context of a database system, is gonna be a sequence of one or more operations that are going to get invoked on a shared database, and we want to have them, and they're, they're meant to perform some higher level function in our application. So the first thing to point out is that we have one or more operations, and these operations could be SQL queries. If you're using like a NoSQL system, they could be gets or puts. Right? It doesn't matter for the database system point of view. Right? There's just something that's actually reading or writing data in our database. And a shared database means that we can allow multiple transactions, think of like multiple threads or multiple clients, connecting to this, the single database system and modifying you know, this shared database. And this high level function thing is a, is a concept that has really no meaning in the database, database system itself. It really has to do in your application. So my example of sending money from my account to your account that would be this high level function in the system. The, the, the data system has no, no function called send money, right? That's written by you and the application developer in your application code. But the way you're going to achieve that high level function is through these low level read and write operations that the database system sees, okay? So transactions will be the basic unit to change of a database management system that supports concurrent or supports transactions, right? I can have a single, if I have a single query, single update statement, That'll still be in the context of a transaction. I can have a single query transaction. I suppose you can have a, you know, a, a zero query transaction. It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't do anything. But technically, that's still correct. So we really care about one or more. Things are going to read and write to the database. So again, using that example that I talked about before, sending money out of my account, right? Say I have a gambling problem, and I need to send $100 from my account to my bookie's account. Right? So that, the transfer of money from my account to my bookie's account, that's the higher level function of the application. But the way we're going to actually implement it is through three steps. We're going to first check to see whether I even have $100. I may or may not, right? Then we'll take $100 out of my account if I do, and then we'll put the $100 in my bookies account, right? So again, those, that, those three steps are what are going to be comprised of a transaction. And we're going to want all these steps to occur safely, atomically, and not worry about seeing the effects of other transactions running at the same time. Right, these are all the guarantees that a database management system is going to uh, ensure for us. So a really simple way to actually implement a database system that can support this would have the following architecture. Right, so I'm proposing a system here, and we discuss what it's actually doing and see if we can do better. So what we're going to do is that we're going to have a single thread in our database system, and that single thread can only execute one transaction at a time right, in serial order. So if I have multiple clients all connected to the same system, and they all issue tr you know, transaction requests at the same time, I'm just going to have a queue, the thread's going to pick whatever's in front of the queue, take it off, run it, complete it, then go back to the next one, right? It's going to execute in a single thread. So only one transaction will be running at a time. And then when a transaction starts running, what it's going to do is it's going to make a copy of the entire database, right? Assume our database is a single file on disk. I'm going to make the copy of that, that entire database file, put it into another location, then modify that file, the copy I just made, 
And then when I'm done and I'm complete and I know I've made all the changes I want to make, then I just have a pointer inside the system to say, instead of pointing to the old file, now I point to the new one. And that's the current state of the database. And then the next transaction starts and does the exact same thing, makes another copy, modifies it, and then flip the pointer. Does this sound like a good idea or a bad idea for both of these two parts? She's shaking her head yes. You think it's a good idea? Why? Why? So let's start with the first one. Single thread. Why is this a good idea? She says it's simple, right? You're not wrong, right? You don't have to do any latching to B plus tree that everyone you know, freaked out about because this is a single thread. You don't have to do pretty much anything we're talking about here today. But what's the downside of that? What's that? Slow, exactly, right? So say if I, uh, if, if I got to read something from disk and it's not in memory, not my buffer pool manager, I got to stall while I go fetch that. And then now the system, essentially, because is, is, I only have one thread, is stalled. It looks like it's un, unavailable, unresponsive. Right? What about the second part? Right, before I start my transaction, I make a copy of the database file, modify it, and, and then when I'm done, I, I just flip the pointer to it. So what's the, what's the benefit of this? She already said it. It's easy. It's simple. Right? I, don't have to do, I don't have to worry about anything. I know, I know the transaction is running at the same time. I know that I'm not going to see any partial writes or, or, or intermediate state of the database file. I'm the only person that's doing it. I copy it, and I'm done, apply my changes, and, I'm, and then now everyone can view it. Of course, now what's the downside? Yes, sure. Right, if, you're, if, you're, if your file is 10 gigs or, or, or one petabyte, you know, this, this, is not, this is not realistic. So can anybody actually think of a system that would, or does anybody know a system that actually does this? We've already talked about it in this class. Hmm? Postgres, no. Think smaller, huh? MySQL, no. There's one other major one. SQLite, exactly, yes. This is SQLite. Or this is the old version of SQLite. And again, when you think of what SQLite was designed for, embedded devices like cell phones, or even smaller things like you know, little IoT devices, this is fine, because maybe they don't have multiple threads. Right? Actually, this bottom part is, so the top part is still true for SQLite. The bottom part is, um, this is what the older version of SQLite used to do. Now they're going to use right head logging the way we're talking about here today and, and, and later on next week. Um, but you still can, I think, toggle a flag or something to still get this bottom thing, right? And again, think of like SQLite running on a cell phone application. Your database is going to be what? Maybe like you know, a couple hundred ki kilobytes? And you're really only going to have one thread, you know, one app modifying it at the same time. So this is fine. But now when we start scaling up more cores, more machines, more complex applications, then this is not going to work. So a potentially better approach would be allow for concurrent execution of independent transactions. Right? Multiple clients can issue requests and make modifications and read and write data to the database at the same time. Right? And I'm saying potentially here for the exact reasons she said before. She said that, oh, it's simple to implement my previous approach. It actually turns out in some cases it's going to be faster. And we'll see this later on in the semester when we have VoltDB come uh, give us guest lecture. They actually implement a variant of the SQLite approach that I'm discussing here because now you don't, need, you don't need to do any latching in your B plus tree because only one thread could be operating on the database at the same time. But the way they get scalability is they have multiple sort of, on a single box, they could have multiple cores, multiple threads running on their own separate partition of the database or separate shard. Right, so it's, but the high level is essentially the same thing. So we've already said why we sort of would want this, right? Because right, we're going to get better utilization and better throughput in our system because if one thread has, you know, one thread has to get something from disk, it'll stall, and other threads can come along and still make forward progress. Right? It's, and the system will look more responsive. Now the downside is going to be, though, we, we need to make sure that we, even now that we're interleaving operations, that we can still have... Uh, the, you know, the database end up being correct after these interleaved changes. And I'll define what correct, correctness is in a few slides. We also obviously want fairness, right? We don't want a transaction that maybe takes for an hour to run. Uh, you, don't, you, don't, you don't want that to block everyone else. We want to sort of have a, a balanced approach of allowing transactions to interleave those operations and everyone try to make uh, best use of, of the resources. So again, both of these concepts are going to be really, really hard. Right? It's hard to ensure the correctness of transactions that are interleaving operations in an arbitrary way. Right? So let's say that I'm trying to pay off two bookies at the same time. I only have $100. I owe them both $100. They're going to break my thumbs. Right? 
we don't want the application to try to issue a request to make changes to the database at the exact same time and not verify that I only have $100 to give. You don't want it to give out you know, $100 twice and, and you know, make money out of, out of thin air. And then you actually want to execute this correctly. Right? So the easiest thing to do is have, again, one, th one thread only operate in the system at a time, but this is going to be slow. So if I want to interleave their operations, I want to do it in a way that doesn't, the interleaved version is not slower than the single-threaded version. So there was a famous, uh, uh, this, so this, this is a good example of why a lot of the, no, this is a good explanation of why a lot of the NoSQL systems, maybe 10 years ago, when they came out, said, oh, look how much faster we are. We don't do SQL, we don't do transactions, right? Because it's really hard to do to make this all work really efficiently, right? And only now are the new SQL systems that are actually survived, you know, the, the sort of initial flood of interest in this, only now they're going back and some of them are adding transactions, right? MongoDB just added transactions about a year ago. Cassandra has sort of lightweight transactions. Now, there's a lot of application scenarios where you don't need transactions the way we're talking about here. But I would certainly say anytime you're dealing with data you, do, you can't lose and you, do, you can't f*** up, like you don't want to have incorrect information in your database, then you, you want to use transactions. Right? There was a famous uh, it was a Bitcoin exchange. It was running MongoDB. If I remember correctly, somebody figured out that Mongo, they weren't using transactions because they were using Mongo, and they were able to basically bleed out all the money from the, the exchange. Right? All right, so again, the, what's going to happen is now we're going to start interleaving operations in our database. We're going to have a bunch of uh, problems come up. So the first is that we're going to have temporary inconsistency. Right? If I take $100 out of my account and put it in your account, there's going to be a brief moment before I put the money in your account where their money isn't there. Because right? I can't magically have the money appear from one location to the other inside of our database system. From the outside world, it'll appear as if it moved atomically, but internally it won't always be the case. So this is okay because this is unavoidable. But what we don't want to happen is, again, permanent inconsistency, meaning I transfer the $100, then something bad happens, and I don't, I don't put the money into your account, but I took it out of my account, and now the $100 disappears. So that, so that second one is the bad one, and we want to avoid this at, 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 uh, at all costs. So now it's sort of obvious to sort of say, all right, well, I get it. If I'm going to transfer $100, I don't want to lose that $100, but that's sort of like a, you know, a sort of a one particular example. We need a way to actually define what it means for interleaving these transactions to actually be, or operations to be correct. So we want to define what it means for the database to be in, in a correct state. So for now, again, we're going to say here is that transaction is going to allow to uh, execute uh, one or more operations on, on the database, right, doing reads and writes. And we want to make sure that the interleaving of those operations end up being correct, right, if we have multiple transactions at the running same time. But that by correctness, I really only mean the things that the database system can see. Right? So again, it can only see that read A, write A, read B, write B. It only sees those things. It doesn't know anything about what you have in your application code. So, so let's say I have a transaction, again, that, transferring money. I take the money out of my account, then I put it in your account. Then I send an email to you and say, hey, you, you just got $100. But then I go try to commit that transaction and something bad happens, like I lose power. Right? And I need to roll back that change. Right? I can do, I, the database system can roll back that change on the, in, on, on the data inside the database, but it can't retract that email. Because right? that's something in, in the external world of the system that it has no control over. So these transactions only have, the scope of these transactions are only based on what the operations are that run inside the system itself. Right? Anything else is just, you know, you, you wrote your application incorrectly, I can't undo that change. So now we're going to find that our database is going to be a fixed set of named objects like A, B, C, D, whatever. And the two key points about this is that I'm saying that the database is fixed, right? For today's lecture, we'll just assume that if I have 100 tuples, I only have 100 tuples. We're not worried about inserts or deletes yet. We're just talking about reads and writes. And then the other thing is that I'm saying that they're database objects, right? I'm not saying whether they're tables or databases or single attributes or single tuples. All the protocols that we'll talk about for the next couple of classes work the same no matter what the, what the sort of granularity of the object is. We're going to assume they're most, you know, you, you can assume that they're tuples, but the same concepts work for, for you know, pages, for, uh, for, for tables, and everything else. And then we're going to find our transactions as a sequence of these read and write operations, right? So read A, write A, read B, write B, right? 
And again, this is the only thing that the database system actually sees. It just sees these read and write operations. Right? SQL queries, you know, at the end of the day, just translate it into these things. Because right? these are the read and write operations you do on, on the access methods to either indexes or, or tables. Now in SQL, the way you would start a transaction is with the begin, begin command. Right? You can issue, issue this from the terminal and say, I'm going to be begin a transaction. And the data system will set up a bunch of metadata to say, all right, you're about to do a transaction. Let me keep track of what you're actually going to do. And the transaction will finish with either a commit or abort command. I think also the SQL standard says instead of abort, you can use rollback. Some systems actually support both. Um, I forget what Postgres does. So if you issue commit, and that commit is successful, and this is actually an important point, I told the data system commit my transaction. The data system can then decide, I can't let you commit, you're going to fail, and then throw you back an error message to say your transaction actually didn't commit. So, you, so even though you told the data system commit, it isn't actually truly commit until you get the acknowledgement that you committed. Okay? So then at that point, that transaction is, is fully uh, persisted, fully saved, and you know if you crash and you come back, all your changes will still be there. But for abort, all the changes you made in that transaction since that begin statement, they'll all get undone, and then the, the state of the database will be put back into the form or t uh, to the way it was before the transaction ran. So it'll be as if the transaction never ran at all. And as I said, this abort command can either be issued by you and your application, or the data system can come back and say, hey, whatever you're doing, I can't allow you to proceed because that's going to put me in an incorrect state. You actually have to abort, and I'm, and I'm, I'm rolling back all your changes. So an abort can either be self-inflicted, like you shoot yourself in the head, or you'll see this in project three, where you can force other transactions to abort because you don't like what they're doing. So now the correctness criteria we're going to have for our transactions is defined by the acronym ACID. Atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. So the story goes, so there was a German guy that invented this in the early 1980s. And the lore is that, for whatever reason, he, he was in an argument with his wife or something like that. And his wife didn't like candy, didn't like sweets. She, she, he said she was a bitter woman or whatever. So he, he named acid after her, right? Whatever. Uh, there's also base, which we'll cover later, in distributed systems, which is the opposite of this. But the, so atomicity is going to mean that all the transactions, all the actions of a transaction have to happen, to have to complete, or none of them happen. Right? This matches up with what we said before about no partial transactions. Consistency is sort of a weird one. Uh, it's not really going to make sense for what we're talking about today because we're focusing on single node databases. But when we talk about distributed databases, if you ever heard of like eventually consistent systems, this is where this concept applies. But it basically means that if every transaction is consistent, and the database is consistent, then if I execute a transaction, the end result should be consistent. Right? Again, I'll, I'll explain what consistent means in a second. Isolation is one we're going to spend most of our time on. Right? This is the hardest one to get right. This is where, where as we execute a transaction, we want it to have the illusion that it's executing on a machine on the database by itself, that there's no other transactions running at the same time, even though there really will be. And right? that means essentially you don't want to see any of the changes from, from any other transactions, and they shouldn't sh see yours. And the last one is durability. It basically says that if a transaction commits, you get the acknowledgement that it commits. Actually, let me reverse that. If a transaction commits inside the data system, we, we acknowledge that it, internally that it committed, then no matter what happens afterwards, whether we, 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 the machine crashes, the data system crashes, when we come back, we should still see all those changes made by the transaction. The reason why I sort of had to undo what I said just now, you can actually tell the transaction, the data system to commit it will commit it for you, save everything to disk, but then before you get the, the message that it's committed, it could crash, and you never get the message. Right? That's OK. Right? Right? We, can't, we can't prevent that. You just have to come back and check to see whether your thing actually truly committed or not. Right? We'll, we'll talk about this in, in a second. The shorthand way to think about all of these is that a, uh, atomicity means all or nothing. Consistency says, it looks correct to me. Right? Uh, isolation says, I'm running as if I'm by myself, and durability says, I can, I can survive all failures. So we're going to go through each of these one by one. We're going to focus mostly on atomicity and isolation for now. Durability we'll cover when we talk about uh, log, you know, logging methods and, and checkpoints. And then consistency will come up more in when we talk about distributed databases. OK? All right, atomicity. So there's two possible outcomes of executing transaction, as we said before. So either the transaction commits, 
And all its, all its actions, all its operations are applied successfully to the database system in the order that you requested them. Or it'll be aborted either by yourself or by the database system. And then all your actions, all your changes then get reversed. Right? And so the database system will guarantee that these transactions are atomic, meaning that from the application's point of view, all right, the transaction either executes all the operations that it wanted or none of them. All right? Again, it makes sense. If I want to send money from me to you, I, you know, I, I don't want the, you know, I don't want the money to sort of disappear halfway, right? Because because of a crash. I right, said so we go again. We take hundred dollars out of my account, put it in my bookie's account, right? If we take the money out of my account, but then there's a power failure before, before I put the money in the bookie's account. When we come back, we should have, you know, should, should, should it, the, the database should look as if none of the, none of the operations ever changed. So the hundred dollars should go back into my account because I wasn't able to complete the transfer into to the bookie's account. Right? That's the core concept of what a transaction looks like in, in, in a database system. So how do you actually achieve this? Well, again, we're going to cover this more when we talk about uh, recovery. Um, but the, at a high level, one way to do this is through logging. So every single time I'm going to make a change to the database, I'll write a little message in a, in a separate log file that says, I'm taking $100 out of Andy's account. And then when I, when I put the $100 into my bookies account, I put another log message that says, I put $100 in the bookies account. And then when I go to commit, I make sure that log is written safely out the disk and persisted. Once I know it's durable on disk, then it's safe for me to tell the outside world if I commit. Because now if I crash, I can come back and look in the log and say, what was going on before my crash? And let me make sure that the state of the database rec uh, reflects what was in the log. So this is a bit more of it, but it looks a lot, this is kind of like how the black box works in, in the airplane, except you don't put anything back together, right? If an airplane crashes, they go find the black box and say what, what was occurring in the airplane right before the crash, right? So to piece, piece, the, the, you know, piece the disaster back together. So logging is pretty much used by every modern, modern system, right? And, and it, not just in databases and file systems, in other distributed systems, at a, at a high level, everyone's doing some type of logging, right? And the benefit you get for this is it gives you an audit trail, meaning you can always go back and say what was going on in my system at different times. Like if you're a financial firm, you need to keep track of every financial transaction in the last seven years. You can use logging to, to be able to do this. And it's also, it, it's gonna make from an implementation standpoint, it makes writing data at the disk actually really more efficient because now I can do just sequential writes out the disk from this log record and then I can have my proper pool manager flush out uh, dirty pages you know, asynchronously in the background, which will be ran random I.O. Right? Another approach to do this is a lot like the SQLite example that I showed in the beginning. Right? This actually has a name. It's called shadow paging. And so typically the way it works is not you don't copy the entire file. You actually copy just the pages of the file that are, that are being modified. Right? These, these are called the shadow copies. Then you have your transactions apply those changes in the shadow copies. When your transaction commits, then you just flip uh, some pointers inside of a directory that says, all right, the latest version of this page is now the one I just modified. Right? So this is actually the original idea that IBM came up with in the 1970s with System R. Right? They, did, they did shadow paging. Um, it actually turned out to be a really bad idea or difficult to implement. Um, and actually, performance was not that good compared to write-ahead logging, the one I just showed before. So they abandoned this in the 1970s when they switched over to uh, to build DB2 in the early 1980s. So now, as far as I know, the only two systems that actually still do uh, something that looks like shadow paging, the way that IBM did it, is CouchDB, um, which is a NoSQL document store, and then LMDB, which is the embedded in-memory engine for OpenLDAP. All right. So we actually tried using shadow paging in a newer project to implement uh, database engines on the new non-volatile memory stuff, or the devices, storage devices from Intel. And I had this awesome idea of thinking like, oh, shadow paging from the 1970s would work really well on, you know, Intel's latest devices in the 2010s. Turned out to be not, not true, and logging still always fastest. Again, we'll, we'll explain these two methods in more detail later on. Right? But this, the main idea here is to show you, would, if you, you need this, something like this, in order to ensure atomicity. Because right? think about it, if you had your buffer manager now, if I wrote to some pages, those got written out the disk because they got evicted, but the transaction hasn't committed yet, and then you crash, come back, and fetch in those pages, 
now you have changes from a transaction that it didn't actually commit. Right? You have, part, you have torn, torn updates of partial transactions, and that we can't allow. So these methods will, will handle that for us. All right, the next one was consistency, right? And there's the basic way to think about this is that the database is meant to represent a, you know, this, something in the real world, right? Think of like Amazon, Amazon storefront. That's most of, that's just a model what a real you know real brick and mortar store would actually look like. You have items, you have customers that make purchases, things like that. And so the idea is that if our database is modeling the world in a, in a correct manner, logically correct, correct, then any changes that we make to that database should always end up putting us in a logically correct state. And any questions we ask about that data should always be logically correct. All right, now we're getting into the logical correctness, which is different when we talked about latching. We talked about physical correctness of the data structures. Now we're talking about high-level concepts that you would define with you know, referential constraints or integrity constraints. So there'll be two types of consistency we have to worry about. Database consistency and transaction consistency. So database consistency is sort of what I was saying. If we're trying to model something in the real world, we have these integrity constraints that, uh, that we're going to use to enforce to make sure the data inside that, in the database is actually always correct. Then any changes that we make, we'll always make sure that the, in our database will still always be correct. Right? If, if, I, if, I, if I make a purchase, and I, sorry, if say I buy an item, I have a transaction that, that makes a purchase in, in the database, if I come back tomorrow, I should be able to see my, my purchase information, right? Because the future transactions can see the effects of the previous ones. So you may think, all right, this is kind of stupid. This is kind of trivial. Of course, I should be able to see what I can see from, from the next day. But think about now on a smaller scale. If I make a change and my transaction commits and I come back the next millisecond, I should be able to see that change. And this is where the distributed database stuff starts coming to play. Because now if I make a change on one node and I come back to another node in a millisecond, I should be able to see that change if I'm trying to say I'm consistent. On a single node, it doesn't actually matter. On a distributed base, it matters a lot. Again, we'll cover that later in the semester. Transaction consistency is this sort of foo-foo-y thing. It doesn't kind of really mean anything. Right? It just means, well, it does mean something, but like, it, we don't care. Uh, it just means that if my, if my database is consistent, my transaction is consistent, then if I run my transaction, then the end result my database should be consistent. And so we have no control over this. Because right, it's up to the application programmer. If they write shitty code that we don't have control over and that puts the database in an inconsistent state, we can't stop them from doing that. Right? So let's say that I have a list of customers, a list of people, and I have their email addresses. And again, in the real world, you can't have an email address without an at sign. But I can write crappy code that goes and puts a, a, a record in there with an email address without an at sign. Now our database is inconsistent. Right? But we, we can't stop that because we, you know, all that's in the application code. The data system doesn't have, you know, didn't, the data system will do whatever you told it to do. So if you told it to in insert bad data, it'll insert bad data. We can't stop that. That's why I'm saying we don't care about this because we can't, from a, from a database system point of view, we can't control this because it requires us to understand what the application really wants to do, and that's impossible. Right? Because that's a human, a human has to make a value judgment about this. So there's nothing we really have to do about, you know, do about this. Again, we care about database consistency more, more about this one. Okay? Isolation. All right. So th this is where we'll spend most of our time. So the idea of the isolation guarantee for a transaction is that our, tr our application is going to submit multiple transactions simultaneously. Because right? we have multiple threads in the application, multiple re user requests, and we want to be able to execute these things at the same time. So we want the users to write their code in such a way where they assume the transactions are the you know, their transaction invocation is the only transaction that's running at the system at that current time. Right? Th that it has exclusive access to a shared database, even though it really doesn't. Because we already said we're going to interleave things. Right? So the question is, how are we actually going to achieve this? We've already talked about this before early in the semester when we talked about modifying the index at the same time with different threads. Right? We're going to have a concurrency show protocol. We said the concurrency protocol is going to allow us to interleave operations at the same time on a shared object, in this case a shared database, and we want the 
database system, the database to end up with being end up in a correct state. And now from our point of view, in concurrency control for, for transactions here, it's logical correctness that we care about. Right, we assume that underneath the covers, we're already using latching and protecting our data structures and our buffer pool manager. We assume that that's all we physically correct. Now we care about making sure that the data we're putting into those data structures is logically correct. Right? That I, again, I don't lose money from transferring money from one account to another. So the, after this class, we'll have two lectures to talk about different protocols, country protocols you can use to execute transactions. But at a high level, there's essentially two categories, to do, two ways to do this. There's a pessimistic approaches where you assume transactions are going to interfere with each other, and therefore you have to make them ask for permission to do something before they're allowed to do it. What does that sound like when we talked about indexes and crabbing? Latching, right? Before I was able to allow it to traverse to the next node, I had to acquire the lock for it, or the latch for it. Same thing here. Before I'm allowed to update a tuple, I have to acquire a lock for it. Optimistic approaches are where you assume the transactions are not going to conflict. You just let them do whatever they want to do. Again, underneath the covers, we make sure that the, the, the data structures are physically sound. And only when we think there's a, there's a, there might be a conflict do we go actually go back and, and rectify things and, and fix things. And again, this is a lot like the optimistic lock, latch coupling, where I assume I can make it all the way to the bottom to the leaf node without taking, you know, taking read latches without any problems. But if I get it wrong, you know, if I end up having a need, you know, an, an exclusive latch, a right latch at some point, I just undo what I did and come back and do it again. But now I, I, I take a more, uh, I take right latches as needed. Same kind of thing. We're going to assume transactions are not going to interfere, and then later on we go check to see whether that was true or not. So again, we're going to talk about two-phase locking on, on Wednesday. That's what you're implementing in, in Project 3. That's a pessimistic current control protocol. And then after that, we'll talk about timestamp ordering approaches, and those are optimistic. All right, so let's take our example. We're taking money out of my account, putting it into somebody else's account, right? And we're going to mix it now with another transaction running at the same time. So T1 is going to do that, that money transfer, take $100 out of A, put $100 in B. But then T2 is going to compute 6% or 6 interest on all the accounts. So it's going to compute the interest and apply that, that interest change to the account, all right? So assuming that both of these two accounts, A and B, have $1,000, we want to say, well, what are the different possible outcomes we could have for any arbitrary interleaving of these transactions? Well, the number of possible outcomes is a lot, right? right we can have t you know, maybe the first query in T1 start, then the second query in T2 start, right? We can interleave these things any way we want. But the thing that we're going to care about to know that whether we have a correct interleaving is, whether, is that the final outcome is that the total amount of money in the, in the bank has to be 2120. Because we're going to start with $2,000, right? 1,000 in A, 1,000 in B. And transfer money to between the two of them is still going to be $2,000. But then we're going to compute 6% or 6 interest on them, on that $2,000. So we should end up with 2120. So now this is a really important concept to understand about database transactions, right? In terms of correctness here. So the database system is not going to guarantee that if you issue T1 first, and then issue T2, that it's actually going to execute T1 first before T2. This is a lot different than maybe you think about sort of parallel programming or you know, uh, bulk syn synchronous parallelism in, in some machine learning programs, right? The data system is allowed to interleave them any way it wants, and it could have T2 go first even though T1 was issued first. And that's still considered correct. Right? And the only thing we care about is that the end result of the database, the state of the database, is equivalent to one where the two transactions were executed in serial order. Either T1 first followed by T2, or T2 followed by T1. Because right, the thing we only care about is that the final sum of, of the two accounts is 2120. So I could either have, if I execute T1 first, I would have this, this guy here. If I execute T2 first, I would execute that. Right? But again, you add these two up together, they're always 2120. If you cared about T2 executing for T1, in, in our model, what we're talking about here, then you would execute T1 first, then when it's done, then you can execute T2. Now, there are some systems 
uh, that are called, this is, this is called external consistency or strict serializability, which we're not going to cover here. But there's some systems where it will guarantee that if you issue T1 first, and then if you issue T1 first, then T2, it'll execute them in that order. But that's way stricter than what we care about here. The only system that I know that actually guarantees that is Google Spanner, or F1. And they need it for some ad reasons. I don't think, I don't know if, I don't think CockroachDB or TidyDB does that. All right, so again, we can visualize this in, in terms of these schedules. Right, so the way to understand this is that we have two columns T, for T1, T2, and this is going forward in time. So T1 starts, does begin, then we do our operations, then we commit, then T2 starts, does, does its operations, then it commits. Right? So it's sort of going from, from the, the top to the bottom is going forward in time. So again, the end result of these two schedules, even though A and B have different values, if you add up the, the two amounts together, you get 2120. So from a database, database system perspective, these are both considered correct, even though A and B are different. So why do we do this? Right? Again, we, we already said this before. We want to mask the slowness of physical resources we have to deal with, like reading data from disk, going over the network. Uh, that's certainly what they would care about in the 1970s. But now in modern systems, we have a lot of cores, and most of our data is going to fit in memory. We want to have these different cores running at the same time, right, and interleave their operations to take advantage of, of the, you know, all the hardware, that, the, the additional benefits that, that Intel's giving us, right? The clock speeds aren't going any faster. We're, we're just getting more and more cores, so, so we want to take advantage of that. So that one, if one thread stalls, one transaction stalls, another one could keep going. So now let's start interleaving our operations, right? So here we're going to have here, what we're going to have here is that T1 is going to start first. It's going to take the hundred dollars out of A. Then there'll be a context switch. So assume we have on a system that only has one thread, right? One core, only one transaction can, only, multiple transactions can be running simultaneously. But there's only one program counter, and we can only do one operation at a time. So T1 is going to start, does the deduction on A. Then there's a context switch. T2 starts. Then we compute the interest on on A. Then we switch back here and do B. Switch, switch back here and do B, and then they commit, right? So again. This is equivalent to a, a schedule where the transactions are executed in serial order, even though they were interleaved. Because again, all I care about at the end of the day is that the, the value, uh, the sum of the two values at the bottom are the same. And as we'll see as we go along, sort of the, the intuitive thing you're, that should, should be obvious about why this actually works is because I always made sure I did the, whatever operation I wanted to do on on in transaction T1 on an object, that had to occur before the, the corresponding operation on the same object in T2. So I made, made sure I always took the money out, put the money in on A or B before I computed the interest on it. Right? Because if you don't do that, you end up with something like this. Right? I take the money out of A, then I compute interest on it, on A, then I compute interest on B, and then now I take add the money to, to B. Right? And now I end up with a sum that's not equivalent to 2120, and the bank is missing, missing $106. Right? So you may think, all right, this, this is not that big of a deal, right? The bank lost some money, you know, it's okay, right? Well, you, you, you'd be pissed off. You, you, know, you weren't given the interest you, you thought you were owed, right? And now I $100, think of a billion dollars. So the reason why. Uh, so the reason why it makes this tricky is because the database, again, the database system doesn't see these sort of, you know, A equals A minus 100, or B equals B plus 100. It doesn't see any of those sort of arithmetic operations. It just sees read and, reads and writes. So it can't infer any meaning about what your application is trying to do and to make any decisions about how to interleave things, right? So essentially these, these you know, this A equals A minus 100, this is actually a read on A followed by a write on A. Doesn't, again, it doesn't know anything. So, again, we sort of see at a high level that this sort of that makes sense that we want these things to be, you know, whether one is, is correct, as, one schedule is correct versus another, but we need a more formal way to actually uh, judge this, right? And so what we're going to say is that we're going to say a schedule can be correct uh, if it's equivalent to a serial execution schedule. 
So it's sort of obvious, a serial schedule is one where the transactions will, will don't do any interleaving. You execute one followed by another. another. And then we're going to say something is equivalent to it, one schedule is equivalent to another schedule if for any possible database state we, we could ever have, right? For any possible values of A and B in our, in our example, the effects of executing the first schedule, the state of the database after executing that first schedule is identical to the, the state of executing another schedule. Right? It doesn't matter what, what operations we're doing inside of the, the, the transactions, we just see reads and writes. As long as this, the state base is absolutely identical, all the values have to be exactly the same, then we can say they're equivalent. So now, building upon this, we can say that a schedule is considered serializable if, for, no matter how the operations are interleaved, that if it's equivalent now to a, a, a serial execution, execution of those transactions in that schedule. All right, again, going back to the so consistency stuff we talked about before, if the state base, database is correct in, in, in consistent using one, executing the transactions in one schedule, if that's equivalent to or identical to the state of the database that's produced by a serial schedule, then we can say that, that the interleaved schedule is considered serializable. So is this clear? All right, a lot of heads shaking yes, good, okay. So, this is what I was sort of saying before, that the, the terms of correctness in a data system is slightly different than how you may think of this in your program, uh, you know, in, in sort of regular programming languages. Um, and the reason why we, we want to do this, the reason why we're not going to say just because you issue a transaction first doesn't mean we're going to execute it first, is that this flexibility is going to allow the data system to choose, have more options available for deciding how to interleave your operations and your transactions in a way that can pr produce more, more parallelism, right? Because again, if I execute things in serial order, then that's essentially the same thing as a, serial, as a serial thread executing transactions one after another. But if I can interleave them and not care about having to match exactly how you submitted your transactions, then that opens up more opportunities for, to, to, to mix things up and get better parallelism. Right, yes? So he says, uh, wouldn't external consistency be easier on a single node? No. G give me a second, I'll show you an example. Where even though you issue transactions first, the final outcome will be, will be different. All right. So now we, we, we need a bit more formal definition of what it means for something to be equivalent. All right? We still, we still, we still understand at a high level what it means for a, a schedule to be serialized, but we understand, you know, what exactly does that mean to be equivalent? So the way we're going to define equivalence is going to be based on uh, conflicting operations. So we're going to say that two operations conflict in a schedule if intuitively, if, one, if, if the two operations come from different transactions and they're both operating on the same object and one of the, at least one of those operations is a write. So put in other words, we can have different type of anomalies that can occur if we have incorrect interleavings of, these, of our transactions. So we can have a read-write conflict, a write-write, a read-write, write-read, and a write-write conflict. Why no read-read conflicts? In the back, yes. Right, there's, there's no issue. Who cares if I read the same object as you? Right? It doesn't fucking matter, right? Like, there's no conflict. So we only care about if at least one of them is a write. So let's go through each of these one by one. So a read-write conflict is also sometimes called an unrepeatable read. And the idea here is that if I try to read the same object twice in my transaction, and I get back different values both times, then that's an anomaly. That should not happen if I was actually truly executing in isolation of all other transactions. So T1 is going to do a read on A, you can read on A, pause, and then read on A again. T2 is going to read on A, then write on A. So when T1 first starts, it does the read on A, and it gets back $10. Then there's a context switch. T2 starts running, and then it's going to read $10 from A, but then write back $19 on, on, into A. Right? It's going to add $9 to it. But now the transaction commits. I have a context switch back over to T1. 
Now if I read A again, I get 19. And that's not the same thing that I read before. Right? So this is an unrepeatable read. I'm not able to read the same object uh, multiple times. Right? This is easy to understand when there's a single object. It gets really hard when, the, when there's ranges. But we, we, we can ignore that for now. The next type of conflict is called a write-read conflict. Right? This is basically you're allowing transactions to read uncommitted data and do things that they, you know, exposing information about the uh, to the outside world about an inconsistent state of the database. It's sometimes called a dirty read. So T1 is going to uh, a read on A, gets back $10, writes back $12 to it. Then there's a context switch. T2 starts. It does a read on A, sees 12, and that was the $12 written by T1. But then it writes back $14. Right? Ignoring the fact that we're overwriting what a uh, transaction T1 has written, right? at this point we've committed, and now we've told the outside world, hey, we read 12, and we wrote 14. But now, when we go back to T1, T1 ends up aborting. So we need to roll back that write on, on A, right? but the problem is T2 already read that value and was allowed to commit and tell the outside world, hey, A equals, equals $10, $12. Right? So this is, a, this is a read of dirty data, data that was not committed yet. The last one is a write-write conflict. Right? So T1, but T1 and T2 are going to do a read on A and, and write on B. So T1 is going to start, does a read on A, then T2 starts, writes $19 on it. Sorry, T1 starts, writes $10, T2 starts, writes $19, then they write Andy into object B, then I commit, but now T1 starts up again, and he writes Justin Bieber into B. And then I commit. So what's the issue here? Yes. So he said you have a pair of values, right? I'll put it in other terms. You have uh, the state of the database contains updates from T1 and contains updates from T2. And our transaction should never let that happen, because these things are supposed to happen atomically or isolated from each other. So it should either be $10 Bieber or $19 Andy. But now, at this point here, we have $19 and Justin Bieber. And that should never happen. Right? So given these conflicts, now we can understand what it actually means for a schedule to be serializable. Right? So what we're going to go through now is how to, t for a given arbitrary schedule, to how to actually determine whether it's serializable or not, like true or false. So the thing that always sort of trips up students in this part of the lecture, we're assuming that our schedules are static and given to us ahead of time. So this is not about how to say, if I have transactions coming in, how do I generate a schedule that's serializable? I'm going to give you the schedules ahead of time. Just, just, we're just trying to determine whether they're correct or not, or serializable or not. What we'll discuss on Wednesday is how to work in a dynamic environment where transactions are showing up at arbitrary times, uh, and you may not know exactly what they're going to do ahead of time, to determine a way to generate a, a serializable schedule. For here, we're just worried about correctness for a schedule when we're given everything ahead of time, which again is usually not realistic. There's some systems that actually work this way, most, most systems don't. So now where things get tricky is that we're going to have different notions of serializability. We're going to have a notion of conflict serializability and a weaker, broader notion called view serializability. Right? So most systems are going to try, that do transactions that support serializable execution will do conflict serializability, even though they don't, they don't call it that. They're just going to say, we're serializable. No, as far as I know, no system actually supports what is called view serializability, because as we'll see, this requires you to actually understand what the application is doing in order to infer whether something's actually correct or not. And again, no, no system can do this because it requires program analysis. Okay. So we're going to say that two schedules will be conflict equivalent if they're going to involve the same actions on the same transactions, and all the conflicting pairs of operations in those two transactions are going to be ordered in the same way. And so we say something is conflict uh, serializable if it is conflict equivalent to a serial schedule. So Again, that sort of seems like a tautology. Seems I'm saying if something is conflict serializable, if it's conflict equivalent to a serial schedule, right? What does it actually mean? Well, it just means that if we're able to transform a schedule 
by moving the operations between transactions up and down in, in the order, if we're able to transform it uh, without having any conflicts in a way that's, that is a serial schedule, then we can say that the schedule is conflict serializable. Again, more blank faces. Okay, so let, let's look at this visually. Okay, so say we have two transactions, T1, T2. Both of them are doing a read on A, write on A, read on B, write on B. Okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to take uh, conflicting, conflicting operations between the transactions, and we want to swap their order so that we're going to take all the operations in T1 and try to push that to the top, and all the operations in T2 and push that to the bottom so that we end up with a, a serial, serial schedule. Right? So in this case here, uh, sorry, it's, it's, sorry, it's any operation. And as long as they don't conflict, then we, then we, can, we can swap their order. So read on a, write on A in T2, read on B in T1. They're both operating on different uh, objects in the database, so we can swap their order. Right? Read on A goes up, sorry, read on B goes up, write on A goes down. Same thing, re read on A, write, read on B. These don't conflict, because they're both read operations. We swap their order. One more time, write on A, read on B, write on B, different objects, we swap the order, one more time, and we're done. Right? We look at all the, the anomaly conflicts we talked about before. If, if two operations don't conflict, then we can swap their order. So now we have something that's equivalent to a serial schedule. So we can say from this, our original schedule back here, this is conflict equivalent or, sorry, this is conflict serializable because it's conflict equivalent to the serial ordering here. Right? Again, we're just manually moving, swapping the order of the operations. Let's look at another one. Again, here we, we have uh, read, on, read on A, write on A in both of these transactions. So here, the write on A in both of these transactions is, is, is a conflict. So we can't swap their order, so therefore this is not conflict equivalent to a serial ordering. All right, so this, is a not, is this, this schedule is not conflict serializable. So swapping the operations is easy when there's only two, op, two, you know, two transactions in our schedule. Uh, but when, when there's more transactions, it's kind of, you know, it's a pain in the ass. So we want to see if there's a better way to actually do this. And the answer is to use what is called a dependency graph. So the idea of a dependency graph is that you're going to have, for each transaction, you're going to have a node in the graph, and then you'll have an edge between transaction TI and TJ if and only if there's, a, there's an operation in TI that conflicts with an operation in TJ, and that first operation appears earlier in the schedule than, than the second one. Right? Because again, you can't, that means you couldn't be, able to, couldn't be able to swap them. And so if you have one of these operations, or two operations, you can't swap the order, you just add an edge in the graph from the, the earlier op the er the transaction with the earlier operation to, to the other one. So I think the textbook, this is called a, a, a pre precedence graph. This is going to look a lot like the weights or graph we'll talk about next class and what you have to implement in Project 3. But the weights or graph is about waiting for locks. This is just about the dependencies between, between transactions. So what will happen is we can take our schedule, we can generate one of these graphs, and as long as there's no cycle, then we know that the schedule is conflict serializable. So let's go through an example. So this is that read on A, write on A, read on B, write on B. So in the first case here, we have the, the write on A in T1 and then read on A in, in T2. So this is a conflict, right? We can't swap the order of these guys. So we're going to have an edge in our graph from T1 to T2. Right, because the, the operation on write on A appears before the, the read on A in T2. So the edge goes from T1 to T2. And then we'll just annotate the edge with the object that was uh, that caused the, the, the conflict. Then later on we have the write on B in T2 and the read on B in T1. So we add another edge going in the direction. Right? And then lo and behold, we have a cycle. So we know that this is, we, you know, we, we're not going to be able to swap the order. We're never, this is not equivalent to a serial ordering. Right? Pretty easy. So whether this is helpful, again, when you have more than two transactions, right, you can do the same thing, and, and it's, it's easier to identify what's going on. So we have three transactions. Uh, T1 is doing read on A, write on A, read on B, write on B. And then T3 is doing read on A, write on A. T2 is doing read on B, write on B. 
So the first one we have, the, the, the write on B in T2 and the read on B in T1. So we have an edge from T2 to T1 annotated with B. The write on A in T1, or the read on A in T3, an edge from T1 to T3, right? And then the question is, is this, is this equivalent to a serial execution? The answer is yes, right? Because there's no other conflicting operations that we care about, right? Because right, we've already covered uh, from here to here, right? I guess we would have another edge from there to there. And, and actually, yeah, we'd, like we'd have a, a read on A and write on A here, but that's the same thing as uh, T1, to T1 to T3 there, right? So with just this, this is equivalent to a serial order where T2 executes first, followed by T1, followed by T3. So this answers his question he asked me before, right? Would it always be better just to execute things in the order that they apply, that they arrive? In this case, it turns out no, right? T1 arrived first, but it ends up sort of finishing last. And when we actually look at the state of the database, uh, it's equivalent to being actually executed in the middle if we execute these in serial order. So is this clear what's going on? All right, it's pretty straightforward. Just have the edges from one node to the next. If there's an operation that, that conflicts, in a transaction that appears earlier than, than the other one. All right, so let's look at a more complex example. So here now, I'm actually introducing some program logic in our transaction. Again, I said before, the database system actually doesn't see any of this, right? It only sees and reads and writes. So even though I'm adding a equals a minus, minus 10, or I have the, uh, I'm declaring variables to compute the sum of something, right? The database system doesn't see any of this. Right? This is all done in the program logic of the application. The other thing I'm introducing also too is this like echo. This is not a real thing. This is just to say I'm going to print out the sum. Right? I return the sum to the application. So when we start looking at the conflicts, again, so we start off looking at from the, so the top to the bottom. Here we have a write on A and then a read on A. So we have an edge from T1 to T3, or so T1 to T2 with A. And then later on, we have a read on B and a write on B. So we have an edge going now in the other direction, because this is a read-write conflict. Right? And we said that, again, if there's a cycle in our, in our dependency graph, then this can't be conflict serializable. My question to you guys, though, is that is there a way to actually modify the application code and make it do something different with the exact same read and write operations in the same order, just changing what sort of the pseudocode actually does? There's a way to generate some different answer, some different computation that will always still be correct, even though this is not conflict serializable. So what is this doing, right? So this guy over here is just computing the sum. It's reading A, putting in that to a variable, reading B, and then adding the value B into to the sum, and then printing it out. So this is sort of like the, 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 the interest computation example I showed before, where I kind of need to have exact values of A and B in order to make this, the sum actually work out to be correct. But maybe I don't care about exact values, right? Maybe I just care about counting the number of, of accounts that are greater than zero, greater than or equal to zero, right? So assume I can never go negative, right? So now, if I say, take the value of A, if that value is greater than or equal to zero, then I add one to my counter. Same thing for B. So now it doesn't matter if, if, I'm, if I'm counting these things in between the transfer going on in here, I'm still always gonna get the correct answer. So this is an example of what I was sort of saying before, that even though uh, there may be some examples, there may be some schedules that won't be conflict serializable as we're defining it in, in sort of our, our rigid uh, dependency graph, there may be actually times where if we actually knew what the application was doing, we would be okay with this and it would allow us to actually execute things in parallel this way. So this is another notion of serializability called view serializability. Right? This, this, is an, this is a weaker notion than complex serializability. And the way I think about this is that if we have one transaction in one schedule, reads an object, um, and gets an initial value for it, then in another schedule I'll get the same initial value, and then I do my, whatever computation writes on it, I end up with the exact same high-level state of the database, then that's, then that's okay. So I'm being very hand wavy here on purpose, but I think if I show the next example, it'll make more sense. So let's say I execute three transactions. 
T1 is going to read on A, write on A, and then T2 and T3 are going to do what are called blind writes on A, where it doesn't actually read the value beforehand. It just writes, just overwrites whatever's in it. Right? I just, I just, I just, you know, not even update, it doesn't matter what's there, I just put, put a new value in there. So now if I do my dependency graph uh, evaluation to check to see what's complex serializable, we would see that we have a bunch of, uh, of conflicting operations and we're going to have a lot of edges. So the read on A and write on A, the, the read on A and write on A here, so forth and so forth going forward, right? For all these different operations, sorry. Right? So again, is this complex serializable? Shaking her head no, right? Because we have a cycle between T1 and T2. But when you actually squint at what these transactions are doing, it doesn't matter that actually it's complex serializable. Because what do I care about? There's, there only, there's only one object, A, and the only thing I care about at the end of this schedule is that whatever value T3 put into it, that's the final value of, the, of, of that object. So I actually, I, you know, I end up overwriting the, the write by T2 and write by T1 and just putting whatever, whatever's in there with a the new value. So under complex serializability, this would actually, you can't have this schedule because of these, this, this cycle and dependency graph. But it's actually uh, equivalent to this schedule, All right? right? It's view equivalent. So I do T1 followed by T2 and then followed by T3. Right? Because again, the only thing I oops, sorry, the only thing I care about is just what's the the T three do the final write. So view serializability is going to allow you to do it's, it encompasses all schedules that are conflict serializable, plus these additional ones that support what are called blind writes, and the other corner cases that I showed before, where your application may, may not actually care what the final output actually is, as long as it's as long as it's correct. And I'm defining correct, correctness in terms of what the application cares about, not what the database system sees. So as I said, view serializability allows for slightly more uh, schedules than conflict serializability. But no system actually can do this because you can't enforce this efficiently. Because it requires you to understand exactly what the application wants to do with the database, wants to do with the data. Right? Furthermore, I'll say that there'll be also a, <coughs> excuse me, there's other schedules that are not captured by view serializability and conflict serializability that are technically still serializable, but because, because we don't understand what's going on in the database, we, 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 can't, uh, you know, we, we can't support them. So the spoiler would be when we talk about two-phase locking next class, that's going to be complex serializable. When we talk about timestamp ordering protocols, those are going to be all complex serializable. Right? So they're going to be more strict. There'll be some cases where you could actually be more parallel, and you end up, and you end up avoiding transactions when maybe you didn't really need to. Right? Again, the, everyone does complex serializability because you actually enforce this efficiently. Anything that you want to get better, more concurrency, you have the special cases in your application, which is hard to do. So the way to think about this again visually is that you can think of this this sort of region here is all possible schedules you could have for a set of transactions and their operations. And a small portion of this will be just the serial schedules for them. And that encompasses now all the conflict serializable schedules, and then a larger reason will include all the view serializable schedules. And we'll see this, see this, 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 this diagram in future, in future graphs, because there's going to be things that can sort of span in different directions uh, and, and maybe include things that are, are not view serializable or you know, some but not the others. But we'll cover that next class. All right, so any questions about serializability, conflict serializability, view serializability? Yes? To the beginning, all right. All right, sorry, go. So you're talking about this one. So the statement is, for this example here, when I'm, when I'm back here and I'm reading on A, his statement is, I don't actually know whether this guy is going to commit or not. Because at this point in time, because I'm going forward in time, I don't know anything about what this guy is going to do. So your question is, should you be allowed to do this? Yeah. Or like, if, if T1 aborts, should T2 also be aborted? Right. So his, his statement is, if T1 aborts, 
Should T2 also be aborted? Yes. And so what would happen here, we'll cover this next class, but that, what you're talking about, this is called cascading aborts. So when I actually go to commit here, this is what I was saying before, is like I can tell the data system I want to commit, but I don't really commit until it comes back and says, yes, you committed. So this guy will call commit, but will recognize, hey, you read data from this transaction T1 here. You read object A, and this guy wrote to it. But I don't know whether it's committed yet. So this thing's actually going to pause and stall and wait until it finds out whether this guy successfully commits or not. And in this case here, when we get, when we get this abort, this will call it a cascading abort. It'll cause this guy to get aborted as well. So is this actually an optimistic approach? His question is, is this an optimistic approach? This has nothing to do with whether pessimistic or optimistic. We're not talking about current control at all. This is just saying if you had interleavings of transactions, what are the, what are the problems that can occur? Okay, any other questions? You guys understand it all so clearly, right? <laughs> all right, um, so now finish up real quickly. All right, so for durability, we already discussed, discussed some of these key ideas before, right? The thing we're going to care about, again, is if our database system crashes, either the power gets lost, there's a software bug, the hard drive crashes, something bad happens, then we want to make sure that any transaction that we told the outside world that it committed, you got back the acknowledgement that you committed. That's sort of like a promise from the database system that no matter what happens, I will make sure that your changes are always persistent. Someone may come along and overwrite them with new values, that's okay, right? Because that's, that's all controlled by the application. But no matter what, I will make sure your changes are, are, are persistent, okay? So that's the durability mechanism we're going to care about. Well, again, logging and, and shadow paging are one way to do this because we can write things durable out the disk, right? Because your buffer pool manager is, is ephemeral. If I pull the plug, you lose everything. So we have to persist things to disk and make sure we can always come back and get, see our changes. So we will cover this again in, in two weeks when we talk about the, the logging protocols. But at a high level, again, these are all sort of intertwined. You know, you don't want to write data out before transact. You don't want to write data out from transactions that have not committed yet and come back and maybe only see part some of their changes, right? Everything has to be all or nothing no matter what happens to, you know, to the system. And just summarizing what we talked about so far today, right, atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. As you can see, the isolation is sort of the, the really important one because we really want to have transactions, uh, you know, execute as if they're, they're, they're running by themselves and not worry about and being interfered with by other transactions. Now, just as, a, as a quick aside, the NoSQL guys basically said, uh, we don't care about transactions, right? And we're going to get better performance because we don't have to do all that sort of extra checks we'll have to do on, on Wednesday to prevent transactions from interfering with each other. And it turns out, if you do that, then it makes it harder to write your application. Because all the, the, hard, the, you know, the hard logic you have to write to say, all right, can I read this versus can I write that? Like, if you have to write that in your application, then you have these, like, you know, these one-off JavaScript programmers trying to figure out what the hell they're actually doing. Whereas if it's inside the database system, by, you know, written by highly paid people that in theory know what they're doing, they can do a much better job than what your average programmer do can make sure these things run correctly and provide these asset guarantees. And you know, Google was one of the first guys, or first, first companies really pushing the NoSQL movement in the early 2000, 2000s, like 2004, 2005. They came out with Bigtable and said, hey, we don't have to do transactions, we'll get better performance. But now if you go read the Spanner paper, it's like in the first page when that came out, it said, oh yeah, it turns out it's better off to have some really smart people like Jeff Dean figure out how to make transactions work efficiently in, in the database system and then provide that transaction abstraction to all the, the, you know, the grunt programmers rather than everybody else trying to figure out how to deal with you know, uh, incorrect data or, or the funky corner cases that we talked about today. So it's better off to have really smart people that know what they're doing, make your data system run transactions efficiently, and provide that abstraction to everyone else. And then nobody else has to worry about how to do transactions. You can write your transactions, your application code, assuming you have exclusive access to the database. And then that makes your life easier, makes you more productive. And you sort of think of like, you know, in Java, you don't have to worry about ma managing memory. It does it for you. May not be as efficient, but uh, it makes people more productive. Python's another example. Does that make sense? All right. So um, 
as I said, concurrent control protocols and recovery mechanisms are the most important functions that a data system will provide you. You don't want to write this yourself. You're probably going to get it wrong. Uh, and the thing that we'll see next class is that if it's not clear from this, is that the concurrent control mechanism will be completely automatic. So you're going to call begin, then you write your SQL queries. You're not going to do like, hey, lock this, lock that. You can, but you're in some cases, they can provide hints or things. But most programs don't have to do this. It's all going to be done for you underneath the covers. And again, that makes you more productive because you don't have to worry about these things. You just say, here's the queries I want to run. Run them in any way you want, but make sure that they generate a schedule or generate, uh, modify the database in a way that ends up being equivalent to a serial ordering. Okay? So, next class, we'll talk about two-phase locking. Homework four will go out today. Project three, hopefully, will be posted today with an update for the source code. Uh, and then we'll also talk about isolation levels on, on, on Wednesday because this is actually, this is actually kind of important because I'm going to, I spent the entire day talking about how great serializability is. In practice, most people don't actually use it. And we'll talk about what the isolation levels are to, to how to get weaker, some things weaker than serializability. Okay? All right, guys. Um, Hope everyone's doing okay, and I'll see you on Wednesday. <laughs> That's my favorite all time. Uh, <laughs> what is it? Yes, it's the S D Cricket I D E S. I make a mess unless I could do it like a Geo. Ice Cube with the G to the E to the T. Now here it comes, Duke. I play the game where there's no rules. Homies on the cuff, so yeah, I'm a fool because I drink fruit. Put the bus a cap on the eyes, bro. Bushwick on the go with a blow to the eyes. Here I come. Willie D, that's me. Rolling with Fifth Watts, South Park, and South Central G. And St. Eyes when I party. By the 12 pack case of a 40. A six pack 40 act gets the real pounce. I drink fruit, but yo, I drink it by the 12 ounce. They say Bill makes you fat. But St. Eyes is straight, so it really don't matter.